associations in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, we have been working in very close collaboration with the government and the Ministry of Health and the private sector as well as the government sector related to COVID-19 from the very beginning. Therefore, it's a pressure for me as the president of Sri Lanka Medical Association to welcome everyone, especially the CEOs of the corporate sector and the officials of the uh, Siron Chamber of Commerce for this very important webinar. Today, we have uh, lined up several resource persons, very eminent resource persons for this discussion, uh, including Dr. Padma Gunaratna, who is the uh, president elect of Sri Lanka Medical Association, and also several other eminent doctors and clinicians like Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikram and Dr. Shirani Chandasiri, Professor Sarojai Jai Singh, and uh, Dr. Lakshman Gamlat from the Ministry of Health. And uh, we hope to have a very useful and interactive dialogue with the corporate sector and work out the measures and mechanisms, how we can control the current crisis situation together. Because the, the whole idea is to maintain the economic activities while controlling this situation. And uh, I'd like to thank, thank everyone, especially Dr. Padma Ratna and uh, Mr. Manjura Di Silva, who is the Secretary General and the CEO of, uh, of Ceylon Chamber of Commerce for organizing and arranging this very important activity. And uh, to coordinate and moderate this session, I would like to hand over to uh, Dr. Sajit Edhar Singh, who is the Assistant Secretary of SLMA, uh, to conduct this session. Or to you, Sajit. Uh, thank you, sir. So, uh, first of all, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Manjuri Silva, Secretary General, the, and the CEO of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, uh, to give a brief welcome for the session. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor. Uh, so, on behalf of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, uh, I wish to extend a warm welcome, uh, first of all, to the eminent panel of uh, doctors who are with us uh, tonight, and also, secondly, to the business leaders uh, from the Chamber Board and the committee uh, led by our chairman, Dr. Hans Vijay Surya. I wish to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, in particular, its president, Professor Indika Harunathilaka, and president-elect, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, uh, for responding to our request and making all the arrangements to facilitate uh, this event. Uh, special word of thanks to Dr. Padma Gunaratna, who made all the arrangements. Uh, as for the objective of having this uh, interactive session, uh, we are naturally quite anxious about the spread of the current uh, epidemic and the possible consequences uh, it could have on business activities as well as on the economy as a whole. Uh, so we thought of uh, engaging with the doctors uh, through SLMA uh, to have this uh, interactive discussion to get a better understanding of what's happening, the current status, and also the actions that are being taken uh, to arrest the situation. Earlier, we thought of uh, restricting it to a a uh, smaller group, uh, but later uh, with the agreement of SLMA, uh, we extended it to the committee uh, with the objective of enabling a large group of business leaders to participate and benefit uh, from this opportunity. Uh, as for the format uh, which we are going to follow today, uh, we will have an initial presentation by Dr. Lakshman Gamlat, the Deputy Director General, Environment and Occupational Health and Food Safety Unit of the Ministry of Health. Uh, so he will do a preliminary presentation. Afterwards, the panel will respond to the questions that uh, most of you all uh, forwarded to us, uh, which we have in turn submitted to the panel. Uh, so they will take up the questions and respond to them one by one. Uh, after which, uh, if we will have a Q&A session where a few more questions uh, can be accommodated uh, live and uh, you will have to use the race hand feature uh, that is available uh, to be given an opportunity to present your question. So that will be at the very end. Uh, we will have a short uh, Q&A session where uh, some questions can be posed uh, directly by you. Uh, at all other times, uh, other than when you are uh, raising a question, please keep your mics on mute 
so that uh, there will not be any unnecessary disturbances and i think even the videos if the videos also can be switched off it will help the proceedings so thank you very much for your participation and i will now pass on to the doctors to carry on with the proceedings from this point onwards thank you right thank you mr manjula uh, so i would like to come back to professor indika uh, sir uh, what is your opinion uh, regarding the level of spread uh, uh, in the community in sri lanka about this new uh, coronavirus uh, thank you sajit uh, i mean can i uh, share the screen just to show uh, some of the slides that i would like to see uh, let's see yes i think uh, one answer to your question is is shown in this slide actually as you can see previously sri lanka has managed to control the situation reasonably well and the number of cases were very much limited but now you can see uh, once uh, after the first case was reported from the brandix uh, cluster then you can see a increase in number of patients and the and now the numbers have been higher than it was before uh, in the range of from uh, 600 and 800 like the peaks and uh, average in around 400 to 300 and sometimes around 600 so uh, what we can see is that seem to be a serious situation compared to the previous this may be due to a range of reasons one could be that uh, the the main clusters that were responsible in the free trade zone as well as uh, in the fish market the conditions were very much conducive for the spread like the crowded and the poorly ventilated situations where a lot of people uh, stay in a close confinement for longer time and then probably may have spread into different parts of the country also due to transport and the supply chains and also due to uh, the different behavior patterns so on and so forth so what we can see is this time we are seeing much serious situation so obviously this is something that has to be contained as soon as possible uh, because the way the patients are being reported it looks like that it will overwhelm the health system of the country so definitely we need exceptional measures at this time period to control the situation and even if this is controlled uh, probably at the moment no one can predict exactly what's going to happen but probably it seems that this is a situation that we have to live with for a longer time so uh, all of us all the stakeholders different different sectors we need to be prepared to live with this situation and adapt the new normal so that is very important and also regarding what we should be doing again uh, this is a conceptual framework that uh, that uh, sri lanka medical association and the colleges have come up uh, related to what we call the 3l 3t 3c approach we are for the general public the main areas would be 3c like clean uh, clean in hand uh, and the hygiene and avoiding crowded places and covering mouth and nose then related to the government 3l that is legal enforcement leadership and legislation and for the health sector the approach is uh, trace test and treat first treat uh, trace identify then test then treat in that order and most importantly cooperation collaboration and coordination between all sectors are very important i think this is the most important thing at, at this moment proper coordination between different sectors when it comes to all the stakeholders including including the corporate sector i think these three c's are very important because cooperation coordination and collaboration between different sectors probably that's the key for successful containment or to sajit right thank you sir so i had uh, another question but you answered it uh, with the, uh, uh, the first question also so if you can summarize uh, as the president of slma what are the steps that you can take or advices we can give to the corporate sector and also to the general public to overcome this situation that would be good sir. yes sajit i th- i think the the objective of this meeting is to come out with a set of guidelines of how we can control this situation and uh, we have uh, 
several experts, eminent people, eminent person who are involved in management and control of COVID situation in the country. So we can come out with a set of guidelines. Actually, again, in the about few months ago, we had a similar meeting with Chamber of Commerce, we are able to come out with a general set of guidelines. But probably this time, we need to have more specific set of guidelines. And the main idea is that the situation is kept under control. Uh, and especially, one of the most important thing is strict restriction of the mobilization at this moment. At the moment, many areas are under cur curfew, but it's very obvious that Sri Lanka cannot kept under curfew for a long time. So ultimately the objective should be restriction of mobility while maintaining the essential services and economic activities. So probably and uh, ideally during this meeting, the resource persons will be coming up with different objectives, different strategies of how to achieve that end. Right, thank you, sir. So along with that, uh, I would like to thank Professor Indika since he has to leave for another television program. So thank you very much, sir, for your kind participation. So with that, I will move on to Dr. Lakshman Gamlat, the Deputy Director General, Environmental and Occupational Health and Food Safety Unit at Ministry of Health. Uh, over to you, Dr. Gamlat. I would like to thank the SLMA for giving me this opportunity a large community, especially in the industry. Thank to start with an update on uh, measures on control of uh, COVID-19 infection in Sri Lanka uh, with regards to the uh, uh, industry and because we are handling the... So uh, I will uh, uh, restrict my uh, presentation, uh, which will take about 10 minutes only to the uh, occupational health setting. The, uh, most important concern at the moment. Uh, when the, when the uh, first wave uh, started, uh, uh, we developed these uh, guidelines to uh, start with the economically important uh, settings like plantation sector, apparel sector, uh, likewise. And uh, then we uh, expanded it to the other essential services uh, like transport, supermarkets, and, and etc. Then uh, lastly, we uh, developed guidelines for, for all, all the uh, work settings. So uh, the guidelines you could see on the screen, and uh, this was uh, in fact published on the 17th of April 2020. And uh, this plus uh, another revisions of this uh, to this guideline uh, gave uh, elaborate uh, guidance on how to uh, conduct uh, uh, various work settings. Uh, uh, to prevent COVID coming into our lives. In fact, at that time, our main concern was to protect our people from... Uh, so all these uh, uh, ensured uh, if practiced, uh, um, we could uh, protect ourselves, our lives, our, our workplaces from COVID. So in fact, basically this guideline, initial guidelines, uh, uh, was a preventive strategy. Then came a, a, a period of, uh, uh, that we did not have any COVID case. There were a few cases, all, all of those cases were imported cases. And uh, that time uh, was in fact a strengthening and a preparatory phase for us from the, the the experience we learned from the first wave. Uh, then uh, in this preparatory and strengthening phase, we identified high risk uh, work settings like BUI zones. Uh, then we, we developed preventive guidelines and uh, we went into these, uh, these uh, places, uh, the, 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 the BUI zones, in fact, there are 14 zones in, the, in our country, all over the country. Not on, not only in Gampa and uh, Kalambu district, uh, even in, in, in uh, southern and other other part of the country. And uh, there are 279 BOI factories, and there are some other factories uh, which are not uh, BOI also. Then uh, in the BOI zone alone, there are about 132,000 uh, workers. So uh, obviously we, we we could do all of this, but uh, we visited uh, major factories and. Uh, train the people there on how to uh, prevent COVID coming into these uh, factories. 
In fact, we appointed a focal point in each and every uh, factory to look into these guidelines and to ensure that these guidelines are, uh, are practice uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know the basic guidelines and other other uh, other specific guidelines for specific uh, settings. We have all elaborated on these things for this focal point and the management of these establishments. And in fact, uh, that was uh, running when there was. Uh, uh, no uh, COVID cases or, or COVID transmission within the country. But unfortunately, there was a breach. This cluster started on the 3rd of uh, uh, October 2020. In fact, it was technically started on the 22nd of uh, uh, August, uh, sorry, uh, 22nd of uh, September. Uh, and uh, then the first case was detected uh, uh, on the 3rd of uh, October. So then uh, the second wave of wave started. In fact, uh, now it's the fighting phase for us. So we revised the guideline to uh, face the new situation. So the new uh, paradigm is how to work with COVID. So earlier it was how to pre prevent COVID coming into our workplaces, but now the COVID is already there. So we revised our, our guideline and incorporated two main aspects into the uh, guideline that is surveillance system uh, and what to do when a, when a case is uh, detected. In fact, we introduced surveillance system to all, all of these work settings. Uh, and uh, now at the moment, 1% uh, of these uh, workforce is, uh, is uh, tested with uh, PCR uh, uh, on a regular basis. And through that surveillance system, we detect a lot of cases at the moment. Then we revised uh, the guideline and incorporated four-step approach uh, to be adopted in case a, a COVID positive case is detected. So the, 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 if I uh, elaborate these four steps, the first step is to isolate the case. If a case is positive, uh, sometimes we, we get 30, 40 cases positive. So immediately these uh, cases had to be isolated and uh, we have uh, uh, identified uh, in each and every factory the isolation facility. So the guidelines were uh, revised. Uh, uh, and uh, we did these two uh, more steps that the surveillance system was strengthened. And uh, if a case is detected, what to do uh, was, was incorporated into the guideline. So if a case is detected, or sometimes you get a lot of cases being detected at the same time, so first step is to isolate and keep them in isolation room and inform the authorities. The second, identify the close contact. We had defined who, is, who, a, who a, a close contact is. The, the, the picture in the screen is the actual guideline. Uh, I will, at, at last, I'll tell you from where you can download it. So uh, identify close contacts and uh, we'll have to quarantine them. Now, at the moment, these people are quarantined in uh, uh, sometimes in our quarantine facilities and sometimes in their own houses. So uh, in, in certain other cases, these factories themselves have found their own quarantine facilities. It's a good thing that we always promote if they can find a place for quarantine of the first con contact. Then we disinfect the whole factory and uh, start working. Early it was uh, a different strategy, but now we start working with the rest of the staff uh, with uh, strict adherence to the health, health guidelines and strict uh, monitoring system. So from this uh, website, you can download this, uh, uh, this is our website, eohfs.health.gov.lk. Uh, you can download this uh, new guideline from this uh, website. So uh, in this process, we identified uh, three high-risk situations in these uh, uh, BOI and BOI zones and even uh, uh, outside the BOI zone, which in fact sometimes uh, still which, 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 which be difficult to control. But these, these high-risk uh, situations encourage transmission and encourage uh, spread of the disease. So therefore, we, we have to be very careful in these three settings. That is, the most uh, difficult uh, the, the setting we we we, we uh, couldn't change is this the common accommodation for workers from different factories. In fact, there are boarding places where are ten or twenty uh, workers are 
uh, accommodating in the same place and there are sometimes hundreds of workers are accommodating in the same place from different factories. So if one factory gets the disease and 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 person goes uh, that person goes to this accommodation and he can spread he or she can spread it uh, to all the people accommodated. So therefore, this uh, this uh, in fact we have advised the management to have their own accommodation facilities or to separate these people as much as possible. But uh, it's not easy because they have their personal preference and a lot more things that uh, it's like something uh, it cannot totally correct it, but. Uh, but it's a bit uh, risky situation we have identified. The second uh, risky situation is common maintenance teams. Now, there are common maintenance uh, teams maintaining these uh, machines, uh, visit these factories on a regular basis. So for that, uh, we have included the separate checklist and uh, guidance on how to control these uh, maintenance teams uh, in this new guideline. Then the other risk uh, group is this manpower agencies. Now, uh, Almost all these factories, I think, uh, the manpower is 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 provided by a few uh, agencies. So they uh, recruit people and distribute this manpower uh, among uh, very many factories. So therefore, that is a risky behavior because uh, it can, uh, if one or two persons having, it can uh, lead to spread of this uh, disease uh, to other factories. So there again, we have revised the guideline and. Uh, uh, there's a checklist and uh, a protocol to be maintained uh, with regards to this uh, manpower agency, but still these three uh, settings carry a uh, uh, risk. Now, where, where did I stop here? High risk situation, is that? Yes, that's right. right. Okay, we have identified this high risk situation, common accommodation, common maintenance teams and manpower agencies. In fact, we have developed our guidelines and revised our guidelines to accommodate uh, these concerns uh, also. Then the present situation is that uh, they are uh, allowing this factory to function, but but adherent to the uh, health guidelines, and we are doing uh, continuous surveillance uh, in uh, all these factories, and uh, close monitoring to an established me mechanism is in place. Now the monitoring is done through the uh, PHIs. Uh, and the sonal, sonal uh, heads or the sonal directors. So uh, these uh, uh, focal points in uh, each and every factory will have to uh, have their uh, documents, uh, all, all the health guidance to be uh, document recorded. And uh, these, uh, these uh, statistics uh, recorded uh, should be uh, communicated day to day Sonal managers. We have developed format, so they are reporting daily to their sonal managers, and the Ministry of Health and the relevant MOH get this data once a week. But if a case is reported, that has to be uh, uh, reported to the uh, sonal manager and the area MOH immediately, and uh, that also will be uh, uh, will be looked into, uh, and all those uh, monitoring and. Uh, uh, what action to be taken in in case uh, 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 in case the case has been reported, also uh, documented and uh, uh, monitored, and we have appointed focal points for each and every factories to monitor this closely. And we are from the Ministry of Health is also monitoring these factories very closely. So lastly, uh, these are the contact details of uh, uh, the, any any other resources if you wish to. Uh, reach the ministry, the ministry website, uh, I think everyone knows, our website in the uh, Environment and Occupation Health Unit uh, is the second one. Then uh, somebody has asked some questions about curfew passes and Dr. Champika Vikram Singh is the Deputy Director General of Ministry of Health. And this is her number with regards to that. Or uh, Director General of Health Service is the authority issuing the uh, special curfew passes other than the, uh, the, the work settings which are already allowed to work. Uh, if somebody wants a special curfew pass, uh, uh, they can uh, they can uh, uh, contact uh, these people in obtaining the uh, uh, curfew passes. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, very sorry for the disturbance uh, on the way. Thank you very yes, much, Sajit. Ramlat. Yeah. I don't think that uh, Sajit is available. I uh, uh, thank you very much. I think that uh, it's the time that we would start uh, questioning the yes. uh, other uh, the resource uh, panelists 
I think uh, the first question is posed to uh, Professor um, Manoj Virasinghe. Manoj, are you there? Uh, yeah, yes, madam, I'm here. Yeah, so the, uh, what we would be interested in knowing is that according to current estimates, how long do you think it will take to contain the current situation and bring it to pre-October levels? It's a very difficult question to answer. I have to say it first. The last time I and with a few others did a projections to show how the epidemic would go. And actually we were able to predict it uh, more or less uh, uh, to the actual estimates and the actual uh, things that happened. But this time it's just three weeks or reaching one month now. But the dynamics of this spread is much different from what we saw last time. So giving a brief answer to this, what I, from the epidemiological and public health side, which I see is that at least for next two, three weeks, we will have cases coming. Mm -hmm. Is uh, for example, 50, 100 or 150 cases uh, throughout because uh, to at least about two to three weeks. Sometimes, actually, last couple of days, uh, we saw cases more than 500 coming in two occasions. Mm -hmm. But generally, I would think that we will see cases across, particularly mm -hmm. Western province. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are having an issue or a bit of an issue in Kegol district mm -hmm. and Ahaliagoda. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, these two, there is possibility of further contact going, if you look at from Mahaligodo to the Ratnapura side and from Kegol, we, it's distributed across Kegol actually, at least at least about, in about three to four MOH areas in Kegol. Mm -hmm. So there's the possibility it could spread to few more. Mm -hmm. In uh, Gampaha, I think uh, the, the original places that we had, uh, uh, the cases that we are seeing now is lower than what we have seen. But uh, if you look at Colombo, because I have some general understanding in Colombo, because mm -hmm. I'm also whole last week worked in the at the ground level in Colombo in our own uh, MOH area. Yes. In Kote, what I see is we have a fairly large number of contacts mm -hmm. to a given case. So based on that, uh, that we, what we see. Hmm. We may get at least 100, 150 cases across the country mm -hmm. for at least for two to three weeks that I see because and everything depends on how we can restrict mobility to the extent that we can actually apply public health uh, interventions to mm -hmm. communities and hotspots mm -hmm. in those areas. But if we fail to do certain things, uh, it could go out of proportion. So my general understanding from what we are doing now hmm. and, and, and uh, what we are doing now, tracing, quarantine uh, at uh, homes and, uh, and, and withdrawing cases from the community to three levels of uh, treatment centers at the moment, mm -hmm. at least next three weeks, Basically, I think we need to expect at least 100, 150 cases a day. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to say when we should go to the pre, pre October situation. Mm -hmm. I think we have to live with this for some time, but it does not mean that we should totally stop our economic activities and you should go for the lockdown of the whole country, which I personally don't agree. Right. Looking at our experience for the last seven months, Yes. We should run our economic main trust areas, yes. but without uh, doing unnecessary things where the, we are gathering people and, uh, and, and things. So if we go to the key economic trust and the essential services with the minimal service uh, that we would like to do, then we could go for next two to three weeks without much of a problem, but still having about 100, 150 cases uh, generally a for a day. For a day, right. Yeah, uh, thanks, Manoj. I mean, yes, Gamla. That's all right. Thanks, Manoj. Actually, 
there was one good news, good thing in your uh, uh, answer because that you gave a lot of hopes to people uh, so that you have the impression that we'll get this under control. Yeah, that is what we are trying because I have, I, I, I'm, I'm in the technical committee which we are meeting again on Wednesday at uh, 3 o'clock in the ministry. But from my ground understanding, because I'm handling the forte uh, issues at the moment, I was there for last four, five days in the ground, including going to all the communities. We have two areas which we have locked down from our understanding. So looking at all these, we need real cooperation from yes. people plus all the other, other, other institutes, including business premises. Right. We don't have large uh, areas in Colombo, but four main economic zones in the Western province, what I understand is uh, Katunayaka, Biagama, Watubitivala, and Sitavaka. That yes. is my understanding. Four main areas. We will have, We are having a fairly large amount of workers. We could still run those adhering to the maximum precautions, but vigilance. I think the vigilance is the key thing here. If we see at least a single person who have respiratory issues, I think we cannot ignore. Particularly in the factory factories and business premises and economic zones, we have to be extremely vigilant, take treat them and refer them immediately to the medical office of health of that area, report it and take these uh, individuals, the workers who are actually the real heroes in the country to the healthcare workers. And if we delay, for example, if we delay two days referring a patient, that person that we think should be investigated, that could have an explosion of cases in two to three days. So that is the key that I want to tell. Yeah, thanks, Manoj. The second question is that actually these are the questions that we have been, I mean, has been forwarded to us. Now that asymptomatic patient cases are in quarantine, what are the measures taken to monitor them? Yes, basically about five, six days back. Five to six days back, uh, actually the, the original, uh, original strategy changed from taking all those who were first contacts to government health quarantine centers to quarantine them at home. So this is how things work. So it's not an easy task because I know I have uh, about 9,000 plus about 10,000 people uh, in, in Kote who are now under lockdown. In, in a 70,000 uh, large uh, population. So it's not an easy task. When we take them to a quarantine center, we have facilities there to specifically monitor each and every family, each and every individual on site three times a day and make sure they are not spreading the illness if they are infected to others. So this facility is no more there with us at the moment. Now, for area PHI, the medical officer of health and his resources has to monitor people who are being quarantined at their houses. And you need to understand, these are practical problems I have seen for the last five or six days, that when people are at their own houses, there are about 60% or 50% people who will completely adhere to the instruction. But you need to understand from other 50%, with persuasion, about 20%, we could get them to adhere to the precautions and not they are not coming out or whatever, and we could monitor. But there are about 30% of people who we quarantine at home, but may not really adhere. We can't expect the public health midwife or the, or the public health inspector, MOH, and the staff to police them because there is so much of work to be done in the ground. So that is the issue that we are facing at the moment. And if such things happen in an area which there is potential of further spreading, that is where lockdown, local lockdowns are being done. And the police is supporting, basically, but police is also is uh, actually 
their capacity also becoming bit of an issue because there is about 3000 policemen as i understand is already on uh, quarantine so this is also an issue so for the question that you are asking the measures are the phi generally goes around at least a day one round in the morning to see whether people are there second one is inherited uh, surveillance system the people on the other side of the road would complain that people are moving out of their homes so we get so much of calls that when people move out from a quarantine house or whatever so the people are engaged in this but the issue is sometimes when people actually go out uh, we may not be able to really force them in because it's very difficult one person for 10000 population or 15000 population is not uh, going to work so these are the issues that we are see i am not telling that we have to revert but the general community and the and the others has to support if we are going to really monitor people inside but that, while telling that there is another issue that we need to look at particularly this is a business community and if we have large boarding places and we are quarantining them in that boarding places there are two things we have to be extremely sure that we can provide first thing is we need to have a clear supply line to give the essential food items at least to these people who are in these places if there are about 30 40 people this is which, which we have seen in gampa 30 40 people living in a packed boarding house they have to get food outside sometimes they don't have facilities to actual cook inside so the things that we have seen particularly in sidu amandu other areas in kaduna and boi zone is that they will ask help from the nearby boarding house which are not quarantined but they are going for work so these connections happen if we do not have a clear supply chain second one is that we need to make sure these people in the boarding house can afford to finance them for two weeks if that does not happen still they have to ask for help from other friends and others who will come to their boarding house to give money or food or something like that so these are the things i would like to say uh, right. that we have to correct thanks manoj thank you very much because that uh, as we are pressed for time i would skip one question from you and i'll come back to you if we i mean if time permits Uh, could I uh, uh, ask this question from Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama? Is Ananda there? Ananda? I think I'm. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm here. Yeah, Ananda, they are interested in knowing what's the treatment given for COVID patients, COVID positive patients at hospital and at quarantine centers. Is is there a difference? Uh, at the moment, uh, we give hydroxychloroquine. to patients who have covid positive patients who have symptoms for asymptomatic patients we don't give uh, majority are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic so they don't uh, we don't give uh, hydroxychloroquine for those patients but if they have uh, fever cough the sort of main symptoms then we treat with them uh, hydroxychloroquine that decision was made in march when we started having local patients and that time there was some maybe there was some evidence uh, to show that there was there is some benefit with hydroxychloroquine but later that was challenged and then uh, there's no uh, at the moment there's no conclusive evidence to say that it is beneficial but uh, we have seen in our opinion there may be some effect that's why we continue to use this and also we feel that it is a fairly uh, harmless drug uh, so we are confident in using that Uh, in others uh, majority of patients uh, they don't need treatment they just get some vitamins uh, that's all uh, the second question is is there any advantage in regular steam inhalation as preventive measure for covid-19 infection can steam kill the virus um, the virus when the virus gets into the uh, respiratory system this uh, respiratory illness so it comes it goes into the body through the nose uh, to the mouth maybe through eyes also uh, then it quickly goes into cells the virus gets killed uh, 
generally in a temperatures of around uh, 50 uh, centigrade degrees but when you steam uh, when you steam then uh, the, the temperature in these cells will not rise to that level uh, i mean if you steam uh, continuously with very uh, uh, very hot steam then it can but then the cells also will get uh, killed uh, so steam will not uh, help in killing the virus however the steam may be helpful in uh, uh, reducing the congestion of the nose, the congestion of throat. In that sort of setting, uh, that sort of the benefits are there with steam inhalation. How that affects the, the infection, we don't know. Uh, since it is a sort of simple procedure, which can be done uh, without a problem, we don't discourage doing steam inhalation, but then we have to understand that it will not, it, it doesn't kill the virus. Right. It so may that, be having other, uh, other benefits, but it doesn't kill the virus. Yeah, two different yeah. settings. No, Ananda, that what uh, they are interested in is that whether steam has any preventive role. I don't think that there is any prevention if by steam, I, isn't I, it? I, I don't think so. I don't think and, so. and for treatment, it may be useful, symptomatic treatment. Yes. Uh, the, it relieves it, it the symptoms. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's another question. Is there a way to build the immune system to protect you from getting infected? Uh, generally, viral infections, uh, then when you have good immunity, you can get protected from viral infection, but of course, it's highly variable from other known viral infections like chickenpox. People get uh, the, that when they are quite healthy also. So similarly, what you are saying is this virus affects pe quite healthy people. On the other hand, uh, there may be some role in uh, uh, enhancing the immunity, and there are no sort of... Uh, uh, artificially improving immunity. The known ways of improving immunity are having a good diet and having a, doing regular exercises. Those are the known ways of improving immunity. There's no point of taking various uh, vitamins and other things to improve the immunity. Or a special form of drugs. Are there any other uh, local Ayurveda or anything that would improve immunity, you think? Uh, I, I don't think I'm in a position to answer that uh, because uh, these things has to be tested and uh, there has to be some evidence. There are traditional medicines which we use, uh, which a lot of our people use, but uh, those are used on their own beliefs, based on their own beliefs and wishes. But uh, we are not in a position to recommend anything because nothing is proven to that effect. Right, thanks. Another last question is how close are we to the maximum capacity of the medical system to test and treat COVID cases? Uh, that all depends on how we decide to treat. Uh, and if I may share the screen just to show one slide. Now, uh, this is uh, what happened in Australia up to today. So they had a first outbreak, then a second wave. And then uh, they had a big uh, lockdown went on for nearly three months. And then they were able to get down the cases down to fairly manageable levels. So it all depends how we can get down these case numbers. We have to get down these case numbers for several things. One thing is, uh, of, of course, we may not be able to admit all the patients. We will have to be selective at some point. But then it has to be at a manageable level. On the other hand, the other problem we are facing is which is not addressed much, is that we get a lot of patients uh, falling into the category of suspected group. And they come with, the, for example, they come with a myocardial infarction, and there is this suspicion whether this one could be COVID or not, and then they get tested, and there can be uh, overcrowded. There are boards to keep these patients, but now they are getting free. So it is not only the COVID patients who feels the the dedicated boards, but the other patients are more than that. When you get more patients, positive patients, then there are a larger number of uh, suspected patients. So we are getting our health system is getting compromised because of this. And the other issue, issue is uh, now we are getting uh, more and more health workers infected. And that leads to uh, quarantining more health workers. So it, it, it becomes a uh, uh, in increasing problem. So we have to get this under control 
uh, when we were listening to Professor Malik Pires at one of the meetings, he said in this journey, which we'll have to go for maybe a year or two, uh, a country has to put breaks from time to time. What he meant was we have to go into a certain uh, significant restrictions of mobility to bring down the case numbers. And then when the case numbers are at a manageable level, we can go to a near normal level again. And then again, maybe after a month or two, we might have to go uh, impose uh, uh, measures of restriction. So if that is done, I think uh, that has to be done. Otherwise, we will not be able to manage this, not only in health sector, it will affect other sectors also because a lot of workers get affected. The companies will not be able to run their businesses. Uh, so for, from all the aspects, we'll have to get the case numbers down with time to time, severe restrictions of mobility. Uh, thank, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, could I hand over to Sajit because it looks like Sajit is back with us. Sajit? Yeah, uh, thank you, madam. So next I would like to uh, move to Dr. Shirani uh, Chandrasiri, uh, the consultant microbiologist and the past president of Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists. Madam? I'm here. Yeah, uh, madam. Uh, now, what, what is your knowledge on uh, the genetic strain of this new virus? Is it uh, more virulent than the previous strain that we have encountered previously? Or how uh, it has come to Sri Lanka? Can you just uh, elaborate on that, madam? Uh, virulence, we don't know. Actually, I think this question came because two days back, Professor Nirika Malavigi published her findings. Yeah, yeah. About what she said was that this virus has more transmissibility, not virulence. That mm -hmm. means in the respiratory epithelium, earlier if you had like 1 million particles, now you have 2 million particles. Because of that, you shed more viruses. More shedding means more infections in surrounding people. Otherwise, it is not the same word as virulence. It's transmissibility. We don't know whether it's more virulent or not. From that study, we can say it has more transmissibility because of that mutation. Uh, Madam, uh, uh, do you have any idea where it has uh, come from, the no. new strain? But this is the... Uh, Circulating strain, most common strain in the world at the moment. Okay. We can't say it. Uh, a study. Right. Uh, Madam, now uh, the, other, the next question is, now the government is more uh, planning more towards to reduce the PCR test and shift to an, an antigen testing. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you uh, elaborate on that, Madam? There's no plan to reduce PCR testing. Mm -hmm. But yes, most probably antigen test will be introduced in the near future. And, uh, will it be available in the private sector also, madam? I think so, but uh, I don't know about the date, but I think there's a, a company who got registration and the company is getting it down to the country. Okay, uh, now, uh, I will come for the most burning question. Now, we see uh, in, in the television also for the news that a lot of people are spraying the disinfectant uh, on the working places and all the places. So, does any spraying of the disinfectant uh, to the working environment, will it be beneficial or harmful, madam? Spraying is, I think, more harmful than beneficial. Whenever you consider disinfectant, you have to consider the concentration, strength, and contact time. What we are spraying is TCA and chlorine yeah. very easily released from the compound. When you spray, the chances are more. And when you spray, there's a chance that other people can inhale it and it can cause some reactions in the lung, even can lead to lung fibrosis. So the best thing is to wet mopping with TCA and allow Correct concentration is 1,000 particles per million. Allow at least five minutes contact time and mop it. Remove it. 
after that time, I mean, allowing that contact time, that is better than this. And what I saw in these pictures is open areas, open areas you can't do much with spraying. This chlorine will just get into the soil and it will be more harmful. Because it can cause changes in soil also. So this is not a good idea, I think. Yeah, uh, Madam, uh, now we previously issued a statement also in the College of Microbiologists about this disinfectant chambers. If you can mention it again, uh, it would be helpful for the other uh, sectors also. Actually, this is environment. Earlier, we were spraying it to the humans. That was yes. also useless because the virus is in the respiratory epithelium, not on the skin. But by spraying, we were destroying the common cell bacteria which were useful to us. And again, spraying caused inhalation and allergic reactions, lung fibrosis and problems. I mean, some of these problems you might see in future, not immediately. So I think the best thing is to continue without doing extreme measures. Just because the caseload is going up, we should not resort to these measures which are not useful but more harmful. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much for your opinions. Uh, next, I would uh, move on to Dr. Gamlat again. Uh, Dr. Gamlat? Yes, Ajit, yeah. Yeah, uh, Dr. Gamlat, I would like to ask uh, whether we can resume our international tourism in Sri Lanka, again with the uh, current context. In fact, uh, we were about to start international tourism uh, uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, we developed a guideline and uh, there was a, sp a special technical committee appointed to look into the uh, ways and means of uh, how we should be starting uh, this uh, international tourism again. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the second wave came up and so therefore we uh, uh, postponed it. Uh, therefore, at the moment, uh, the, uh, in fact, with this, uh, uh, we were we have uh, completed our guideline on uh, cricket also. So we were uh, very much hopeful that we would uh, start the uh, international tourism and uh, international cricket matches. All uh, were within weeks uh, uh, ahead when this uh, second wave came in. So therefore, now it's not the time to, in fact, the data general has written to these authorities that this is not the time to uh, think of those uh, uh, risky uh, uh, settings. Therefore, uh, yeah, once this is under control, we can think of it. Uh, and we are ready with our guidelines, uh, but not at this moment we can start it. But uh, once this is, uh, uh, if, uh, under control, we can think of uh, international tourism and uh, uh, cricket matches also. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. And uh, I would like to ask, is there uh, any difference in the quarantine process uh, in Sri Lanka or the foreign passport holders or the diplomats who's traveling to Sri Lanka? Yeah, the Sri Lankan uh, expatriates who are arriving in our country, they have to uh, undergo two weeks of quarantine in a designated place. Uh, uh, decided by the uh, uh, government and uh, there's a little uh, deviation for the uh, diplomatic community. Uh, they have to get the PCR test done in their country within 72 hours of their departure from that country and uh, then uh, if not uh, we will do a PCR at the airport and uh, uh, on negative PCR, we will allow them to come in and they are allowed the home quarantine for two weeks uh, in their own, uh, own accommodation facility, the signature facility uh, in the uh, uh, diplomatic uh, facility itself, or, uh, or uh, there are some quarters, or there are some designated facilities for them. So we allow uh, two weeks of quarantine for them, and after that, uh, they can join the team in, the, in their offices. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Any uh, specific advices or guidelines for the, especially for the apparel sector? Yes, in fact, in my presentation, that's what uh, I presented. That's especially for yeah, the yeah. apparel sector. It's especially for the apparel sector because uh, even before the second wave came in, we have identified this apparel sector as a high risk, uh, high risk setting. 
So therefore, that's why we did a special program. So twenty programs, we appointed focal points. We designed the uh, the uh, now we have designed the, uh, the 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 surveillance mechanism and strict monitoring is now going on. So therefore, the guideline I showed you, which can be downloaded from our website, is especially for the apparel sector. But most of those things can be adapted in other sectors also. But uh, that uh, guideline was uh, especially developed for the apparel industry. Yeah. And sir, uh, now they are more interested uh, to know that uh, how long that uh, they have to wait. The companies have to wait, uh, wait or work remotely. How long that they have to wait, or should they go for a permanent or a long term reduction in the office and administrative functions, or they do have to reduce the their spaces or working remotely to promote it? Yeah. What is that your is opinion on that, sir? Uh, they should be happy because uh, if it was in the in the, in the first phase, it's kosher, kosher. But this time, uh, we are uh, developing these guidelines uh, on how to work with COVID. So, uh, therefore, uh, it's very difficult to say how long we, it will uh, it will uh, uh, affect our country and it will uh, be there with us. But as uh, Dr. Anand said, uh, it will maybe one year or maybe two years. So until it uh, or in between, it is if it is totally controlled like we did uh, last time. If it is totally under control, we can relax certain measures. Uh, but definitely not this. Uh, what we are now implementing in the apparel sector, because those are very congested uh, uh, settings, uh, especially the uh, accommodation facilities are very congested. So uh, until COVID is there in the world. We will have to continue the, especially the uh, apparel sector and the and the and the, uh, the, the bigger factories will have to uh, strictly adhere to the health guidelines. But once the situation is under control, we can relax the, uh, uh, the, the this situation of working from home. So working from home can be relaxed uh, depending on how the transmission within the community is. So if the community transmission is uh, brought, brought back to uh, or near zero, we can allow people to uh, enjoy the freedom and enjoy working physically in the offices uh, at that time. But uh, I think nobody can at this moment uh, tell how long will it uh, take for us to start such uh, 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 normal uh, activities as we enjoyed uh, a month ago. Yeah, uh, the final question for you, sir. What about the curfew passes? It's used for the company or the staff transport. Uh, yeah. Is it from the police or the MOH officers? How this uh, yeah. the companies can obtain that? In fact, uh, this time the uh, curfew, the issue of curfew passes have been uh, uh, relaxed to a uh, large extent. Early it was uh, through the recommendation of the Ministry of Health, everybody allowed to take... Uh, uh, obtain these passes from the police. But now, uh, yesterday, uh, I think it would have seen in the media uh, about 50 odd uh, uh, work settings, uh, government, uh, private, and other work settings have been listed uh, as essential services. And uh, any person working in these uh, work settings can travel to, uh, to and from uh, those uh, from home uh, or accommodation places to this, these uh, working places. Uh, by producing their, uh, their working identity card to the party. So that can be, that that is regarded as a curfew pass. Mm, so therefore, a uh, large majority of workers uh, who are listed in this uh, uh, listing, uh, which is about 50 odd uh, settings, uh, can travel uh, using their identity card as a uh, curfew pass. Others, in special uh, circumstances, if they want a third curfew pass, uh, they can justify the reason to the reason the, the nearest police station and obtain a curfew pass. If it is, uh, if the police uh, think that uh, a recommendation of the health ministry is needed, then they will have to uh, uh, ask for the curfew pass from the Ministry of Health. They can send an email to uh, the Director General of Health Services, the official email dghs at health.gov.lk. I displayed that. Uh, dghs at uh, health.gov.lk. So if you uh, send a, a request uh, to the DGHS or contact Dr. Champika Vikram Singh with the Deputy Director General 
uh, in the Ministry of Health. Uh, she's the, uh, uh, the, the authority uh, uh, for arranging uh, these passes. In special circumstances, anybody can uh, request uh, from these sources and uh, the Ministry of Health will issue a recommendation to the, uh, the nearest police station uh, for them to issue the curfew pass. Thank you, sir. So yes. with that, I will move on uh, to Professor Saro Jai Singh, huh? consultant physician and professor in uh, Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, uh, University of Colombo. Uh, sir? Yeah, hi. Good evening, everybody. Hi, sir. Yeah, hi. good evening, sir. So, first question for you, sir, uh, is uh, what are the uh, antiviral drugs available for COVID patients? I think any, uh, any antiviral drugs? Sir, I think Anand uh, briefly mentioned about this and certainly he will fill in some of the details, but uh, so far, we have uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, as you mentioned, uh, which uh, is being used on symptomatic. But uh, other than that, uh, the effective uh, drug so far is uh, dexamethasone, but that is when it is given to seriously ill patients in the ICUs. Uh, remdesivir uh, also variable effectiveness. Some studies are saying it's useful. Some are saying it's not useful, even though I think uh, even President Trump got it. The uh, antibodies given in serum form so far, again, the jury is out. We are still not sure. Uh, but when a person goes into the ICU, again, Ananda has much more experience than me. Uh, they have learned certain things such as uh, giving uh, uh, giving drugs to thin the blood, then positioning the patient on a prone position uh, and so on. So uh, compared to March, we know something more can be done uh, and we know more about the disease, but uh, as for specific drugs, so far dexamethasone is uh, being used in the severe forms. And there's some evidence that uh, vitamin D uh, deficiency is uh, something which makes people more susceptible to the infection. Uh, but other than that, uh, we don't have uh, many drugs available. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. So, so what about the vaccine situation? Will it be available uh, by early next year? Or is it a success or... Uh, will it be a IM form or an inhalation type of a vaccine? What sort of well, would be a again, better just, yeah, Again, we are in the dark because there are probably about 49 plus or more clinical trials going on. Uh, and there are so many other, those are more advanced clinical trials. And you would have heard in the news of uh, certain trials being stopped. See, basically, the yeah. vaccine is uh, where you look at the, you know that the virus is a RNA surrounded by, it, it's covered in a protein. So you can take the RNA and pieces of RNA and make a vaccine. You can take pieces of the surface, like the spike protein, et cetera, and make the vaccine. Or you can inactivate, that is, you take the virus and uh, basically inactivate and use the whole virus. I mean, so there are various combinations of this and several countries are in the race. So we have China, US, India, Cuba, Israel, uh, and so many other countries, even Thailand is uh, trying to produce its own vaccine. So the, the, the race is on to produce a vaccine. The Russians are also producing it, you would have heard about Sputnik. Uh, and uh, whether we'll get it or not is going to be the million dollar question. Now, luckily, uh, the WHO has been working with what they call the uh, global immunization, vaccine and immunization, global alliance for vaccines and immunization, which was set up by the Gates Foundation in 1999, plus a coalition for epidemic preparedness innovation and the WHO. So they have formed a global alliance to try and secure enough uh, vaccines to be distributed to the low income and middle income countries. 
and UNICEF is going to take a major role, play a major role. So I'm sure the ministry will also have its stake on this uh, Ministry of Health and Sri Lanka. Uh, so depending on how quickly the virus, the vaccines are produced, uh, we will see them coming through these uh, channels such as the such as the WHO, uh, plus we will get private sector actors who have gone through the FDA and all other approvals and it will be available in the market. So those will be more expensive. So as I see, there be, uh, it will all depend on how this whole thing evolves. Uh, and, but we cannot wait for the vaccine. We already have a vaccine and that is to wear the mask have social distance, not to touch our faces, wash our hands very frequently. All those are types of vaccines because that will prevent you from getting the virus. So short answer, we don't know. Are we trying? I'm sure the Ministry of Health and the government is trying to get the vaccine. Who is going to get the vaccine first? Uh, that'd be a very uh, big ethical debate on that. Uh, probably the most vulnerable should get it first. That is elderly, diabetics, uh, hypertensives, and so on. But uh, those will have to be discussed later. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With that, uh, we come to the end of our valuable discussion. So we'll move on for the open panel discussions if you all have any questions. So you all can uh, use the raised hand option uh, or send us the questions on chat. Uh, Sajid? Yes, madam. There's a question on the chat. Yeah. Uh, so there's one question on the chat. Uh, is there a conclusive evidence and indication to do a uh, private random testing at the workplaces at high cost? Uh, when there are no symptoms as suggested. Also, uh, what is the chance of uh, false positive and negative in the current test? So if Professor Saroj or Dr. Anand, if you all can answer that question. Let me start uh, because I think uh, I'm sure Anand and Manoj will be the better people to answer this. But uh, remember that if the antigen test comes versus the PCR, the advantage of the antigen test, which is supposed to come by the end of this week, uh, is that you can do a lot of tests uh, at a very short time interval. PCR takes 24 or more hours or more. So then the off uh, the the problem with it is that it is very specific. It's not as sensitive as the PCR. It is not as sensitive as the PCR. So you can have false negatives. So in a sense. It might be of use to screen uh, large, for example, factories, whether we should be doing the antigen test every two weeks to see if these rates are going up or not, et cetera. But I leave that, those are about surveillance and screening. Manujan Demma, the experts in this. Thank you. Can I just add a few things to what uh, said? Yes, there are two not. things here. There are two things here. First one is, I hope you can hear. Yes. 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 Sir. yes, yes. Test, when we had a discussion with Dr. Malik Piris about one and a half weeks back, and uh, from the literature, what we understand is we have to be very clear about the purpose of antigen test and the purpose that we use the PCR test. It was very clearly stated that the antigen test or the kit could be used as a screening test to mass screening. And the PCR is a diagnostic test to clearly tell whether this person is infected or not. The antigen test with a higher sensitivity could capture those who are infected, but finally, when we are really looking at uh, in, in, in a 
in an epidemiological way, screening is screening, screening to see what proportion of people are infected. And if we are not sure about certain things, we may have to use diagnostic test. The issue is without a diagnostic test, you may not be able to pinpoint and tell these are the people who are really infected. But it's a costly business. It uh, takes a large amount of time. So for large screening, as uh, the question states, is to screen your maybe a workforce at a given time where there is not much of cases, and but you have to make sure to be vigilant. So antigen test would be a perfect perfect candidate for that. Uh, if I may add uh, to that, a uh, couple of things. One thing is antigen test had been uh, given a lot of publicity and uh, there's some uh, evidence to say that it's a good test. Hmm? But as Professor Saroj said, uh, there's a uh, negative false, uh, uh, sorry, false negative results. But compared to a PCR test, it's uh, it's not a bad test from what what is what the evidence available. However, we are in the process of validating uh, antibody te antigen test kits at the moment. Uh, some, some several uh, couple of samples had been brought to the country, and we are in the process of validating that. So. How we use and uh, when to use will depend on the validation results. On the other hand, uh, if somebody in a factory is having symptoms, I think that person should be tested. We, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Whether to have uh, regular random screening, uh, I don't know whether that is necessary or not. I think it's an arguable thing in my opinion. And uh, there have been many suggestions to test the health staff in my hospital. And I objected. I said, no, we don't. If anybody is getting symptoms, we test, but not as a routine thing. The main reason for that is we take precaution. So in a, in a factory also, if you are sure that uh, you are taking precautions in the factory, not only in the factory, but at their boarding places or houses, uh, and in the during the transportation, if you think you are taking reasonably good uh, preventive measures, then I think you are safe. So I think that is what is important because otherwise having regular testing, there's no end to that. Also at the moment, yes, we say test, test and test, but then where is the end? So you have to take that in that context also because this is not a disease which is going to disappear in a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, oh. and I right. had, uh... Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I add? Uh, yes, Dr. That, Dr. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, the question asked is uh, whether it's justified the high cost of uh, the PCR being a costly test and uh, the, the, the interest has to do it uh, in the uh, outside, uh, in the private facilities, and it's costly. So whether it's justified. In fact, the surveillance is one of the mechanisms in controlling any, any, any uh, epidemic or outbreak. So uh, we need to do surveillance uh, in certain settings, especially in uh, high risk settings, uh, uh, that there's a chance of getting the high risk in the sense that as Dr. Anand said, in the hospitals, they are taking precautions. Therefore, they are quite sure that uh, they, they are not infected. But uh, in contrast, the community and uh, the, the factories, which are, uh, although we have uh, taken the utmost uh, uh, preventive health guidelines, preventive medicine, all that. But still, as I as I told you, there are three points we are very much concerned that things can go wrong in this this place, these settings. So therefore, uh, the surveillance is very important to detect uh, any any uh, asymptomatic cases and take preventive uh, preventive actions. To give you a best example, uh, last uh, last week we tested uh, in the factory about 120 samples, totally. Uh, apparently healthy people and 30 came positive. So those are totally no, 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 no symptoms at all. So if we just left these 30 people, it will be hundreds the next day. So we quickly detected these 30 people, isolated and took preventive measures. So therefore in, 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 in outbreaks and epidemics in certain settings, yeah, yes, it's important, uh, even at a cost, it's important uh, that we test uh, uh, these, these uh, settings uh, as, as a, 
uh, surveillance mechanism to detect uh, especially these asymptomatic uh, cases that help uh, to, to uh, prevent the spread of the uh, disease. So although at a cost is, is, is uh, very useful, but as um, uh, the professor said that uh, we'll be getting these uh, antigen tests which, uh, which gives quick results and, uh, 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 and at a lower cost, uh, which will be uh, used in future for uh, surveillance activities like this. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is another uh, interesting question, uh, whether this Ayurvedic uh, Sudarshan syrup uh, prescribed to be used at the state hospital, whether is it uh, good or bad? Uh, Professor Saroj. Uh, well, uh, yes. You see, uh, uh, if you look at the literature uh, uh, around the world, even in China and places like that, they're using uh, uh, herbal preparations. Uh, so, uh, so this use of herbal preparations uh, to uh, in COVID is something which is being done. Uh, so, as regards to this particular syrup, uh, I don't think there are specific, and uh, so therefore we don't have strong evidence. But if a person comes and asks me whether it's okay to take uh, some of these herbal preparations, uh, I would say that there is no hard evidence and you're welcome to do it. But I'll be very careful about any any um, sort of uh, uh, preparation which causes irritation of the throat. And as uh, uh, described previously, you know, when you use steam and things, you have to, uh, the, the temperature which is required to kill some of these uh, viruses might be damaging the mucosa. So it's a guarded answer I have to give because uh, we don't know whether it's effective. Some people firmly believe it is effective. And there are some people who are vehemently opposing it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, if I may add uh, to that, no, I think what is uh, these uh, Ayurvedic preparations, they are, are traditionally being used for hundreds of years. And we know some of these are quite efficacious in certain conditions. So what is necessary is to prove that that this has been this is effective this uh, sudarshana is uh, uh, is a traditionally actually it, it goes as the sudarshana churne uh, which is mentioned in traditional ayurvedic books uh, and in ayurvedic pharmacopoeia and uh, sudarshana pania is a, uh, is a derivative of that actually uh, there had been uh, animal studies done using sudarshana pania and that had been shown uh, no, no toxicity uh, I think it is high time with this number of patients to do a proper uh, little trial, little study to see whether this is really, whether this really works. Then they, that will be very useful rather than just blindly saying that to use and which of course uh, it's not possible in legally also uh, because uh, the, the, uh, there are a set of rules about using of medications People may not be aware of that, and when they say that uh, to use these things, but then there are a set of rules. So even uh, I personally, whether I am taking it or not, is a different thing. But we cannot prescribe it in the hospital without uh, proper evidence. All right. Thank you, sir. Can I uh, just sir, add one yeah, thing? Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I was actually going to tell what uh, Anand said last. The question is, so it's prescribed to supply garment. I think as far as I know, there is no direct prescription as that. The voluntary taking and prescription have two different meanings, I think. Uh, the, what, what the media was going is that it is prescribed, but I don't think that's true. It's not as far as I know. Yes, sir. So there's another question for the uh, eminent panel. Uh, for using of a mobile application to trace down the close contacts uh, and asking them for self-isolate because uh, it, uh, it says that uh, it was effectively used at Korea and Taiwan. So whether we can use the something similar, uh, whether is, is it suitable for Sri Lankan setting? So what, what are your opinions? Actually, at the moment, what we do is 
uh, when we get a case, we de- do a detailed uh, interview with that person to get information about whereabouts he has gone during the last uh, maybe one week or so and uh, the contacts that he had that is how things have been done up to now in this country and if there are uh, cost effective applications like this it would be useful However, what our issue is uh, to what extent it can be used in our setup at this particular moment. So if there are low cost or free of charge type of things, it could be utilized. But uh, the actual utility would be not be so high if people may have to buy it, pay for it, and so on. And, and, and the accuracy of uh, the contacts that we have, because if you look, go to, for just for example, if you go to the fish market, and uh, whether you could get such a large matrix of things purely by this app, that would be really nice. I am I, Without knowing the actual details, I think it's very difficult to answer. But having something with the advanced technology would be useful if it can be affordable. Uh, can I add sir, to that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this... Uh, in the Western province, the provincial director of uh, health services, Dr. Dambika, has developed uh, uh, such a, an app where uh, she has, in fact, mapped all the current cases uh, in real time. Uh, and the, uh, these MOHs and PHIs can trace and they can go to the place and enter the data of the particular uh, patient or the first contact. So this is a very good application that we are they, they are using now, and the Ministry of Health is now uh, considering to expand uh, this, and that needs certain uh, certain improvements. And but it's very useful that uh, at, at a glance you can see uh, where the cases are, and the, the cases are shown uh, in an uh, I think red color, and the first contact are shown in uh, blue color. Therefore, at a glance you can see in the Western Province where the cases are. And they have beautifully done it uh, up to the grammar Nildari level when you click the patient and all the details are shown, uh, which grammar Nildari is division, which emoji, which pH and all that. So this, that is a good um, a good thing to start with. And now the ministry is, uh, health ministry is working to expand this uh, uh, app to the other part of the country. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, if you uh, don't mind, if you can uh, tell the name of the application uh, or is it available uh, at the Google Play Store or the Apple iStore Store uh, to download it? It is on, it's only for the administrators who are uh, who are currently working on correct control and uh, uh-huh. because the, person, the, the personal data is there. If you click the particular okay. point where the person is, all the name, age, and all that is given. Therefore, it's only f- mm-hmm. for the, the, the health minister officials who are in, in, in public uh, health controlling the activities, uh, they have given the access. And uh, of course, uh, other agencies, I think later, that, that, that is something that we are, uh, we are working on. Uh, some of this data, the, the basic data can be shared with other agencies, but uh, not these personal details of the people. So that that we are working on uh, uh, on how this can be expanded to give more information for the public and other decision makers uh, and uh, those uh, other sectors who are uh, on control. We are working on it. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. So are there any questions? Any more questions? Some of the questions have been answered through the chat uh, by... Yeah, Roja, I, uh, doctor. I'm yeah. Paradise. Can I come in? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, actually, I'm uh, working in the uh, tea sector. I have a particular question with regard to the we use the tea holder bags to uh, pack cover tea. So uh, when we uh, our supplies come, is there uh, uh, any uh, method we can uh, uh, put in place to ensure that these are because we hear that the, the virus will uh, last for a uh, few days on um, paper and other uh, material. So uh, what is the duration the, the virus will last on paper? Because uh, within a day, we bring the 
paper sacks from uh, Colombo to the factory? Is, is it safe to use it thereafter or do we need to expose it to UV rays or something like that? Just to uh, uh, take a precaution or measure uh, to get your advice on that will be uh, great. Dr. Shirani. Yeah, Dr. Shirani. Yeah. Dr. Shirani. I can't actually remember any uh, studies about lasting on paper. I think most of the survival was on metal. Paper does not support that much. Only thing I can't remember whether I have read any studies about duration. So best thing for you is to keep it for like five to seven days and use it. Because virus oh. does not multiply on inanimate subject, uh, objects. It's okay. only on that epithelium. Of human? Yeah. Yeah, we, we carry uh, the stock for about two, two weeks. So I think uh, if we can uh, uh, keep it for about two weeks and use it, it's fairly uh, safe. Right. Doctor, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I add to that? Uh, hello? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, In fact, uh, in fact uh, uh, the WHO and the uh, World Food Safety uh, uh, network that's Infosan has already declared that uh, uh, the virus will not spread uh, through packaging, especially food packaging. So uh, there, there are no uh, demonstrated uh, uh, cases or evidence to uh, say that uh, uh, virus will spread through uh, packages. So that is the current uh, knowledge we have at the moment. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Yeah. yeah. Yes, madam. Gamla, then in that case, how does how is it get transmitted via uh, nodes, the currency? Uh, currency is a different thing. Now, say, uh, uh, now currency, you quickly uh, go from one person to the other. You just say, you cough, it, cough on it, and then uh, within, within a matter of minute, it goes to the next person. But uh, food, once uh, packaged, say, what is, there was a concern earlier with the imported food is, say, from China. But you you know that it, it is there in the in the vessel for two weeks, and uh, another day in the ports, and how it so it takes days and weeks for us to uh, uh, for it to reach us. Even the locally manufactured food once is packaged at least a day or twenty four hours or more than that for it to be uh, transported to the warehouse or from there to the stores. It takes time. So that may be the reason because even if there is a viable virus. Uh, uh, once it reaches uh, our, our uh, outlets or uh, uh, our houses, uh, it would have been destroyed. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Rodrigo, you have raised your hand. You can ask your question. Deva Rodrigo. Yeah, you can hear me now at least. The, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The infection, yes, rate, uh, infection rate is monitored in many countries, uh, either district by district or town by town or cluster by cluster, depending on the seriousness of uh, infection. And I do remember initial days, March, uh, in other countries, they said it could be as high as three times. One patient infects three or 2.6 on average. And uh, in the UK, because I happened to be there for six months, uh, held up there, they were trying to bring it down to less than one. And it came to less than one. And that's the time they really relaxed. Uh, all the lockdown rules. Now, do we monitor the infection rate either district-wise or these clusters mm -hmm. to see whether it, has come, it can be brought down below one uh, before we take this working with COVID, uh, put, in, put that in place? Thank you. Can I just answer what you are referring to? is that we call a sub something in communicable disease as R0. R0 is actually looking at the doubling and the time and looking at how oh, a given patient would uh, increase the next or the transmit to next. So generally R0 is generally seriously calculated when there is a huge community spread. So here actually at, the, at this particular moment, the, the, the data is collected in different uh, places and look, uh, there is some analysis going on to see how within each uh, small clusters it is being spread. These are being done 
but uh, due to the huge workload at the epid unit and uh, some of us who are working also on the periphery what uh, you may get some information in couple of weeks time how it goes from uh, from about 4th of october up to maybe uh, to about 6 weeks time so those this information will be there possibly in 2 to 3 weeks time when the actual data is been analyzed up to now it's very difficult to tell uh, how it behaves r not is the basic uh, parameter that we use in uh, communicable disease spread so that information will be available possibly may in a couple of weeks time. could i please come in on that i believe in other countries it's done maybe we don't have the technology or we are not using the technology they do it very quickly they announce every week now this was in march in the uk so i believe there must be a mechanism to use technology to get this information the r factor or r note or whatever that's what they use there uh, and without having that basic information i think uh, our planning as a country uh, to control this situation will be seriously adversely affected yeah it's not serious technology it's the actual uh, using of data effectively looking at the people and the exponential factors that happen in the ground level uh, some uh, preliminary work has been already done but it has not been still announced that is why i am telling uh, in couple of weeks time uh, there would be uh, uh, predictions of how things are happening. Yeah, uh, there's another question coming about this air bubble concept. Uh, so, uh, if anyone of the expert panel can give a opinion on this uh, bubble concept uh, also. Yeah, in fact, Sajid, uh, this is exactly what we uh, designed a few weeks ago, uh, hoping that uh, these international test matches uh, will be coming to Sri Lanka. In fact, we made the preparations for the Bangladesh uh, to uh, 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 month ago, and uh, uh, this same concept uh, we we designed and was about to uh, uh, convey to the uh, the cricket authorities. Uh, but the problem uh, was that uh, uh, when the second wave came up, and uh, then uh, uh, this is not the time uh, uh, because now. Uh, uh, this is the, the this is the time we are getting more and more cases and the, the curve is going up so therefore uh, it, it's not the time for recreation and things like that because everybody we, we advise them to uh, adapt to these health measures and the country as a whole should be geared towards uh, preventive measures that is one thing and the other thing is that the health workforce is uh, towards uh, preventive measures uh, in, in the in the in the local settings so therefore now, if this, uh, if you invite uh, 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 international team, uh, there may be 50 or 100 people coming in. You have to look after them uh, health-wise also, which involves a lot of uh, health manpower. So at this moment, uh, uh, we are very much strained with our health workforce. That is one other reason uh, for us to uh, postpone it. That doesn't mean that it will be postponed forever, but. Uh, once the the, uh, the curve comes down and uh, we are at a better position, we can uh, think of activating the same guideline again. Right. Thank you, sir. Actually, another question comes from Professor Sarojai Singh. Uh, I would like to direct it towards the Secretary General of Ceylon Ch Chamber of Commerce, uh, Doctor uh, Mr. Manjula. Uh, so, Professor Sarojai is raising this question uh, regarding uh, what is the feasibility of providing a, a better accommodation for the workers to work in or live in in a less infective environment and will it be possible for the workers to work in shift basis mr manjula uh, yes uh, i may not be able to give a direct answer to that uh, yeah, if you can give on... a common, common answer if you can give yeah, a common do. answer that would be fine yeah it will de depend on the different type of industry uh, and, and sort of I think some organizations are already doing that uh, where they have their own accommodation. And, uh, depending on the scale of the company also, some of them will find it a bit difficult to manage. Uh, I think we have some representatives from the apparel sector and other manufacturing 
sectors. Uh, if anybody would like to expand on that, uh, uh, for the can I come in on the plantation sector? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Uh, I'm Pani. Actually, I have yeah, about yeah. 500 workers uh, in the factory. We have about two shifts, but they come from different uh, villages. I have about four or five buses coming, but they are not in dormitory. They go home. So, so as a result, to some extent, uh, we have uh, applied the uh, usual uh, health safeguards. And uh, when they are coming in, we are closely monitoring and the surveillance is done. Uh, unlike in Colombo, where we have, uh, they have rooms with from different factories uh, staying in uh, boarding houses, that risk uh, to a great extent is eliminated in the plantation sector because they go back home to their own houses. We are not in boardings. So to that extent, uh, uh, we have taken, uh, beyond that, I don't think we can work on shift basis because we are, these are all perishable raw material which we take that has to be manufactured the same day. We work 24 hours of the day, 24-hour uh, shift. So whatever comes by next morning, it has to be uh, finished. So we can't keep overnight, unlike the apparel sector. So that is why uh, we go the plantation sector. Uh, Any news from the apparel sector? The ability to sort of keep the employees somewhat isolated, but I think that's to that sector. Uh, the challenge is greater, I think, in, in other areas like uh, apparel. Uh, Felix, would you like yeah. to make a comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yes, uh, although I don't have the experience being in the zone because we are out of the zone. So there are two things. It's basically, I mean, people who operate in the zone, yeah, they do have this problem. I know for certain that, you know, people that the companies who are out of the zone during this period, uh, because they have done certain things, they have provided temporary accommodation for some of the workers that they were not able to come from curfew areas. So that uh, talking to the BUI and temporarily they have arranged certain houses for accommodation for the uh, employees. But uh, coming back to the bigger picture, especially Katunayak and Viegama, uh, this, is, was, this was a problem from the day one because uh, Usually the uh, companies, they used to give a accommodation allowance or something like that for them because no one, no one single company provides accommodation for the workers. So, and they were finding their accommodation uh, on their own. And usually I think, yes, you're right. I think Professor Roger is correct that uh, in some one boarding place they can find. They, like this is something, of course, uh, this was the first time that we are experiencing this thing. Probably, I think we are talking about this matter in length at our association as well. Uh, but I think to implement this thing uh, sooner, it will be tough. Like what we said, they have their own uh, friends working in some different companies, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to, to suddenly stop something like that change. It's going to take time. Uh, although this is some idea that we have started talking at the association levels, but, you know, to implement something like this, it will be, I don't know how long it will take. Uh, may I come in? Uh, I think uh, I, I put up that question just to highlight uh, that uh, in addition to individual behaviors, uh, the, we have to start thinking of certain structural changes which might actually reduce uh, transmission. So in addition to the masks and washing and all this, uh, other things uh, will also reduce transmission. And I quite agree, we can't do this overnight. I mean, we know how difficult it is to change behavior even in the hospitals. But I think we have to start that conversation so that we'll get there someday. Thank you. Thank you. Manjula, Suresh, may I just add to that? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, frankly, I don't. I doubt very much that this, that this is a practical solution because we are currently talking only about factories. Uh, but if you, but if you, for example, uh, example, if you take any one of the big conglomerates, we have a number of employees working in head office environments. So if you take a John Keels or a Haley's or a Carson's or a Hema's or any one of these companies, uh, then, then for example, take places like the World Trade Center. There are hundreds and hundreds of people who work in these locations and providing each one of them isolated accommodation. I mean, it's simply not 
practical uh, and even if by even if the funding was available to do it uh, let's say some of the organizations may actually have the funding to do it it would still probably take very easily one to one and a half years to do it to to actually get it implemented so this, the the danger is not just amongst the factories but it is also uh, outside of the factories and within these large commercial enterprises as well so addressing the factories alone may not be sufficient um and we've also seen or oh, particularly over the last 2 to 3 months we've seen that uh, people congregating in crowded areas is not just only the factory staff but even the more so called educated uh, more sophisticated you know people they've also been uh, congregating in in large crowds and in uh, in in ways which are not necessarily safe uh, doctor was speaking just now about wearing masks and washing hands uh, there have been so many instances where people have got together in very large crowds without any masks at all um, so you know those risks are all so i trying to isolate only the factory workers is not going to help uh, definitely definitely i think i i may have uh... not communicated it properly what i meant was that we have to think of the the other options and tailor make those to the individual institutions i i'm fully with you thank you yeah uh, thank you sir there's another interesting uh, suggestion came from dr anand vijayvikram i would like to put that uh, question also to the uh, apparel sector as well and to the ceylon chamber of commerce uh can we manufacture n95 mask in sri lanka and give it to our healthcare workers and the other uh workers or the employed sector in sri lanka can we ma- manufacture n95 mask in sri lanka and because there's a huge need of n95 mask at the moment uh in sri lanka uh yeah maybe let me let me see sam coming from apparel sector let me answer that question see uh, this uh, in 95 i think this this need certain technology and certain uh, machinery to be imported so that's where i think it's a, we uh, most of the manufacturers most of the factories they didn't have this uh, machinery to start with and some of the factories actually they have taken the orders during the first wave march april may during this period they have take undertaken this one and some of them they have started producing uh, Uh, for the overseas market for which i know uh, we'll take this uh, maybe we are meeting in our jaf association tomorrow we'll take this up i don't know currently what is because during the first wave i think we have produced lot of uh, not necessarily the n95 but maybe the the normal mask and uh, yeah, surgical yeah, mask normal mask produced, yes. yeah no, normal fabric mask and surgical mask they are produced a lot but in 95 let yeah. me check up uh, this matter tomorrow yeah thank you very much and uh, since it's late night uh, and there are no other questions coming in uh, i would like to thank sorry doctor can i can i just ask one last question yeah yeah yeah, yeah sure sure yeah so if you know the six basics of uh, wearing a mask washing your hands keeping a distance don't touch your face don't shake hands don't uh, don't go into crowded areas if everyone were to follow the six basic fundamental steps wouldn't we reduce the spread of this in- infection quite significantly i'm i'm not talking about the existing situation yes we we have a existing situation which is quite dire we need to address that in probably in different ways but going forward if we can get everyone to focus on and and actually action these six basic points wouldn't we stop the spread of this infection quite significantly yes uh, dr manoj manju uh, uh, sir yeah. thank you for raising this uh, uh, this point yes for a la- for large extent we can reduce spreading of the virus but on practice and practical situation what i find we can push for about 50% to do it correctly with force another 20% but practically what's happening in the ground about 30% of the people we find very difficult to change this behavior 
I agree that if we can change at least up to about 80, 85%, we may not be 100%, but we can fairly uh, reach, a, uh, reach a control situation. So to do that, we need a real good behavior change communication strategy directed at these 30% of people. And we have been trying few and we have done a couple of studies to see what are the actual barriers or the, or the, or the weaknesses in the situ system that we, may, we have not, uh, uh, we were not able to do this change. And uh, we are actually proposing something uh, similar to this to push a good behavioral change communication strategy to do this. Uh, but practically, uh, it's uh, far from uh, far from achieving it. We are far from achieving it. It's a very challenging task. If, if yes, I may, agree. yeah. If I may add another point. Uh, now, these six are important for individuals. When it comes to commercial sector and uh, large, say, offices, uh, factories, and so on, another important aspect is having good ventilation. If you have good ventilation, uh, that will prevent the spread of infection significantly. Where are they, that is not there only this, this uh, spread occurs. So if you, can, if you cannot have, uh, so do away with uh, air conditioning, have at least a couple of uh, exhaust fans. Uh, whenever possible, have good ventilation, especially in places like cafeterias, uh, that I, I think we can do, if we cannot do in, in the office. Uh, that will prevent this, especially in uh, this uh, industry setup. The uh, uh, if if yeah, I just uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, thank you. Just a second. Uh, yeah, sorry, just a second. Yeah. Yes, if, if I just could highlight my uh, interested area that uh, with regard to the uh, comorbidities and elderly. Now the outcome of uh, once you develop the disease, outcome of the disease totally depends on the three main important areas, that is the severity of the pneumonia and the age and the presence of comorbidities. In the sense, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, kidneys, liver failure, and this, so on, asthma, and so on. The, so it, generally in the government sector, of course, that we do not get people less than 60 years. But in private sector, uh, is the place that where we see that people working more than 60 years. So I think that that area is some that one need to pay a little bit more attention because uh, 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 as I mean, it's the workforce as well as the entrepreneurs, they both have to take a little bit more extra precautions with regard to age and the other presence of comorbidities. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, madam. Uh... As a concluding remarks, uh, Mr. Fernando, I would like to suggest a small thing uh, regarding this N95 mask, which are going to take up uh, in your meeting tomorrow. Uh, if we, if you all can uh, work with the Colombo Medical Faculty and Jayadunpur, all the medical faculties, as well as the University of Morotua, uh, definitely we can uh, implement some machines and develop some machines that we need uh, to produce these N95 masks in Sri Lanka, something better than N95 also. So we would definitely like to uh, give our fullest support uh, for whatever, whatever the things that you are coming up as the medical faculty. Uh, and uh, they, if we talk to University of Morotua, they would also like to join us. And since it's late night, I would yeah. like to hand over the session to Dr. Padma Gunaratna uh, to give us the closing remarks and to show us the way forward. Over uh, to you, madam. Yeah, thank you, Sajid. Sajid uh, and all. Uh, uh, I think uh, initially mm -hmm. I have to thank uh, Mr. Manjula De Silva, uh, CEO and the Secretary General for, for him for coming up with this uh, initial suggestion of having this uh, symposium that went uh, uh, sort of very, in a way that it's very uh, fruitful discussion for uh, both parties. Uh, I think we all agree that we had a very uh, fruitful uh, discussion uh, with regard to, uh, particularly for the uh, business sector, uh, with regard to uh, continuing to work while taking uh, maximum uh, precautions uh, and uh, precautions for the health of the uh, workforce. 
Uh, I think that uh, uh, the Gamlak's presentation was interesting, uh, particularly because that he could, could highlight this high risk areas that, I mean, basically as a sort of a, a person uh, without being a panelist or the from the uh, business community, uh, but I understood was that, I mean, the guidelines are guidelines that are not straight and that based on what setting that you work, and uh, what uh, the uh, the based on the workforce and the environment that the people are working, one has to come out out of box while adhering to the basic concepts that has been released by the Ministry of Health uh, with regard to health, so that you come out with uh, uh, I mean sort of maximum uh, uh, I mean sort of maximally. Uh, 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 functional uh, UN uh, the the uh, business uh, then uh, uh, it was highlighted the need for uh, need for us to adhere I mean there is a uh, there is a responsibility uh, some form of responsibility to be played by all of us uh, I mean we have the responsibility of not catching the disease and also not giving the disease to another and uh, 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 the the main uh, aspect that we need to pay adherence uh, at this point of time is to restrict mobility uh, while adhering to the other basic uh, uh, health uh, uh, basic health education practices that have been mentioned again and again. Uh, it was highlighted by uh, uh, Shirani that the infection is more transmissible uh, and the uh, disinfectant chambers are not of any use. And also the spraying, I mean, we see again and again in the uh, TV uh, that spraying antiseptics to the environment is of no use, but to mop, I mean, to use TCL in the mentioned concentration and to mop and after leaving it for five minutes and to wipe it off, that would be the recommended way of dis disinfecting the environment. And then the discussion uh, went through uh, uh, at length with regard to providing facilities for workforce uh, in a way that uh, the disease is not transmitted from one person to other and uh, with regard to vaccine and the tests and the uh, possible availability of antigen tests and also the sensitivity and specificity and the need for surveillance uh, of the infection, particularly in this type of an, uh, uh, pandemic or an outbreak. So I think uh, uh, we uh, had a fairly fruitful uh, discussion. We are uh, on behalf of the SLMA and the uh, president, uh, uh, Professor Indika Karuna Tileka. Uh, I thank very much the uh, Chamber of the Chamber of Sloan Chamber of Commerce for coming up with this suggestion to have this very fruitful uh, discussion with the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, over to uh, Manjula uh, for his comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor. I wish to thank uh, the entire panel of doctors for spending two hours of your precious time uh, with us uh, till very late uh, in the night. I mean, it has been fantastic uh, for all of us who joined this uh, meeting. Uh, it has been a very, very uh, informative uh, process. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Indika Karunathilaka, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, Dr. Ananda Vijayavikrama, Dr. Lakshman Gamla. Uh, Dr. Shirani Chandrasiddhi, uh, Professor Saroj Singha, Professor Manoj Vira Singha, and also Dr. Sajit uh, Edri Singha, who did the moderation, uh, and everybody else also who helped from the back end. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for your contribution. And uh, also uh, from the private sector, thank you uh, to all the participants. Uh, we uh, greatly appreciate the role played by the doctors uh, in battling the COVID uh, pandemic and the private sector and the chambers are also totally committed to play our part, the max uh, that we can do. And we will keep in touch with you and uh, hope uh, that we can find more areas where we can collaborate and uh, extend our fuller support uh, to you. Uh, to uh, get over this uh, crisis uh, as fast as possible. Uh, so thank you once again, and very especially to Dr. Padma Gunaratna uh, for organizing uh, this event. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Saroj. Thank you, uh, uh, Manoj, Shirani, and Gamlat, and Sajit, and uh, Sumitra. Thank you very much for your commitment towards Sri Lanka Medical Association. Thank you.